Well, now we're going to swing around to the other end of the world. We're going to be talking about things happening in Donetsk and the Donbass and some of the things you probably never heard about. And we are very happy to be joined as we continue the show by Johnny Miller, who's a British journalist and a press TV correspondent who is currently in Donetsk. Johnny, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we really are happy to have you because I think here in the U.S., you know, you get a lot of news about you know, what is the toll on civilians, among other things, in, uh, you know, the Ukrainian government held territories in Kiev and places like that. But you really don't hear anything about the the daily lives of people who are living in, well, I guess what's now Russia, uh, in Donetsk, in the Donbass. And, and you've been there. And it, talk a little bit, if you could, about the toll that this war is taking on civilians there. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the I'm currently the only, I think I'm the only Western journalist in Donetsk, i.e. Russian-controlled territory in Ukraine. Uh, there's a, a Russian foreign um, government um, contact who tells me that not a single British or American journalist has even applied hmm. to come to Russian-controlled Ukraine. There have been French journalists here, there have been German, there have been Italians. So the, the, the Russian government are allowing Western journalists in. But there's been no French and uh, no British or uh, American journalists here, which means British and American journalists simply are not hearing the stories that are coming out from this side of the conflict. Uh, I mean, I'm in Donetsk right now in Donbass. Uh, let me tell you what the last few days have been like. It's it's one of the most underreported stories in in the world, and it's and it's shocking. Of course, Ukraine now is perhaps the most important uh, war that's happening in, in the world right now. Uh, one person was killed by Ukrainian shelling in, in Kiev, uh, in, a, in a neighboring district, Kiev, uh, Kiev, Kievsky district, next to me uh, yes, uh, today. The day before this, uh, eight people were killed. The day before that, five people were killed. Uh, two days before that, another five people were killed. This is by Ukrainian shelling. Um, I'm leaving Donetsk tomorrow for Moscow, so normally I'm, I'm uh, careful about what I say for security reasons, but my own neighborhood has been shelled many times missiles landed outside my block i've lived in different uh buildings apartments here and i've been here for the last five months on and off uh, three different apartments i've lived in have been hit i was in a church the other day um i tweeted about that two days later the church was hit the cathedral the market next to me has been hit uh going to a youth center uh yesterday uh, a woman was killed, her body was lying on the street just outside, as I uh, reported. I've been to markets, bodies lying in the streets, people waiting for their bus, still <laughs> waiting for their buses, bodies lying in the street. And that's just what life is like here and pe for people in Donetsk. Because the underreported story here in, uh, in Donetsk is that Ukraine has been, is, is, is intentionally targeting its own civilians. People it, it claims are its own civilians. And this has been going on intermittently since 2014. Uh, I'm not sure how much you know about the conflict, but in 2014, there was a Ukrainian nationalist takeover of power, largely supported by Western countries, particularly by the United States, which took power and started uh, suppressing their pro-Russian population, who are largely in the south and the east of the country. Then you had a, effectively a civil war starting. And while Russia is now targeting energy infrastructure all around Ukraine, it's an incredibly underreported story that Ukraine is purposefully targeting its own civilians here. Sometimes it hits energy infrastructure or, or, or administration buildings, but it also creates terror attacks. And it's just incredible for myself as a journalist. I, I don't know much about your news network, I'm sorry, but I can see that you give fantastic space to independent journalists. And increasingly, it's in, and there's some fantastic independent journalists who've been here, but mainstream sources simply don't, journalists don't come here. So they don't get to hear that Ukraine is intentionally targeting its own civilians because it sees them as separatists, it sees them as pro-Russians. And living under this shelling, I mean, I run back to my apartment tonight to do this interview because there's a, sh a bomb landed just outside my apartment mm. and it's a shrapnel that rips these people apart. Uh, children are being killed and I've been to children's funerals being killed in this, in the, in this shelling. And it's an incredibly underreported story because mainstream Western reporters simply are not here. So you, don't, you, you just don't get to hear about it. Uh, and the reason that this is a, such an underreported story, the reason that uh, mainstream journalists don't come here is because they want the European population and the American population to think that there can be no peace here, mm. that it's all Russia's fault, that Russia is evil, 
that there's only one way to finish this war, and that's to pump weapons into Ukraine. And there is a peace to be had here. Uh, there's a huge pro, most, almost everyone here in Donetsk is pro-Russian. This is a, a civil war. It started as a civil war. Everyone here is, is almost everyone here is pro-Russian. And the European governments and the American government doesn't want their populations to know that there is a peace to be had and borders redrawn. Uh, and that's why they're not sending their reporters here to tell the truth of what's happening uh, in Donetsk with Ukraine shelling their own civilians. Yeah, it's so striking to me that you say that no English speaking reporters have attempted to even uh, visit there. I mean, a lot of times in conflicts, you do get kind of um, what, like, I, you know, having been to like spend time in like Syria, I know a lot of people on all sides end up sort of like getting handled, if you will. Uh, is that the way it is in Donetsk? Or do you feel like you're able to kind of walk around and talk to people freely? Uh, and then if so, like, what is the general sentiment that you get? Obviously, you say people are like pro-Russian, um, but their general sentiment about the escalation of this war. Yeah, there's absolutely no handling. I mean, I, I live in an apartment here. There's no, obviously, there's some security concerns. If, if Ukraine does hit a, a military target, it's difficult to get there. I go frontline access. It's very hard to get frontline Russian army access as a British journalist for obvious reasons, but I do get access <laughs> with Donbass militias. Um, but there's, that, that's common in any army. As a, as a foreign journalist, you're not going to get access to the American army, for example. Um, there's, it's, I'm f free to report here. This kind of idea that people in, in, in Russian-controlled territories are hugely controlled or that it, it just doesn't exist. People, the vast majority of people here are pro-Russian. I was here, here in 2014, and there were Western journal, uh, mainstream journalists there in 2014. They admitted as well that the majority of people here were pro-Russian. Now that's changed in the, since I've come back eight years later. Now it's a vast majority pro-Russian because many of the pro-Ukrainians have left. They didn't want to live under pro uh, separatist rule. Uh, they didn't want to be bombed by their own government in Ukraine. So now it's vast majority uh, pro-Russian. And this is why mainstream outlets aren't sending journal uh, journalists here because if, if a lot of mainstream journalists are honest people, <laughs> Good, honest people, and if they were to hear, if they were here where I am now, they would, they would, they would have to report the fact that the vast majority of people here support Russia, and that Ukraine is bombing civilians. I mean, we live under it. I mean, the, the, the streets are, are almost empty now, and it's 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 dangerous. On the, very dangerous on the streets. They would have no choice but to report this. They have no choice to go to the markets, the schools, the bus stations with bodies in the street. They would have no choice to report that. And that's why they simply don't send their reporters here because rep news happens where the reporters are and it's easy just not to send them. Therefore, people don't get to hear about it. Uh, but yeah, so myself working here, it's <laughs> freedom to report. Um, it's, it's a normal situation. You know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think some of the reporting that you've done, a lot of the reporting you've done that we have followed, one of the things that stood out to me that was a huge story here, um, you know, the, the the young woman who was pregnant in the hospital or alleged hospital was bombed and it was the front page of every news and it was huge outrage in the West. You were actually able to find her and talk to her and the story was not exactly the story as the way it was told, you know, in the New York Times and the other elements. I'm curious if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, so she was famous for a picture. She was pregnant uh, at a hospital that was uh, apparently bombed by Russia. It may well have been bombed. I don't know. It may have been an airstrike. Russia was assaulting the city. It may have been a Russian strike. I don't want to get into that. I don't know. A Russia, there's a lot of civilians who are killed by Russian strikes in, in the assault on Mariupol. I did meet one woman whose daughter was killed in that uh, assault. And she still supported Russia. Why? Because a huge amount of people in, in, in Mariupol still uh, support Russia. Now, the vast majority of people in Mariupol do support Russia. But she was pictured pregnant, uh, walking down the stairs uh, by reporters. And that image was broadcast around the world. Of, Look what Russia is doing. And uh, I found her here in, in a neighboring city of, of Donbass. I met her at a coffee shop. And uh, she is a Russian citizen. She is pro-Russian. She has no criticism of the Russian army. Uh, she only has criticism of the Ukrainian army for bombing Donbass for eight years. And that's the story what I'm, that's not being told. Uh, and 
she only has criticism of how she was represented. She says that her story wasn't told. She says there was no Russian airstrikes, but the but mainstream media showed her to be a victim of Russian strikes. But in actual fact, she was she is a Russian citizen. She is pro-Russian essentially, um, and her image has been used to all around the world to stir up hatred of Russia. And what I think the failing is of the mainstream press was to report what she said, uh, which is what I tried to do. I published the whole video interview on my Telegram channel um, of that. She essentially supports Russia. Uh, she's critical of the Ukrainians. And that's what was missing in the, in, in the mainstream uh, media's represent, re representation of that. They just show a picture of a pregnant woman uh, in a bummed out hospital and they don't report what she actually says. There's a famous story of what happened in Syria. I was actually in Syria at that time of uh, Omran in the back of an ambulance. Mm. A famous right. picture of a boy in the back of an ambulance. Remember, I, I was actually in Syria at that time when uh, Syrian government forces took over that area. And I spoke to the father and the father turned out to, to not be critical of the, the Syrian government. And so it's incredible how these images, you know, images speak louder than words as they say, that powerful images can be portrayed when actually not giving the context of the story uh, and are used for, for propaganda purposes to demonize a certain government and to, to, to make people hate, essentially, as well. Make people hate a certain government or to manipulate people's views. Right. I'm curious also, you know, have you ever been to, I guess, the Ukrainian uh, controlled areas? Have you attempted to? Would you even feel safe, actually, uh, given, you know, some of the rhetoric about, for example, like Iran? Um, well, I, I, I was in I, 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 I was in Kiev to start with. I went to Kiev to start with. Uh, and then, and in February. In, in, in March, I think. So oh, when the okay. Russians had surrounded Kiev, yeah. Uh, Festivy asked me to go I haven't worked on it for years. They called me up to, to go and I said, which side? And they said, well, I don't know, Kiev side. So I went there. <laughs> I started reporting for a couple of days and my live interviews went up and I was, you know, I try to be, you know, I'm an honest, I'm an honest journalist, an honest man. I'm critical of you know, both sides and, but also criticize, criticize NATO as well and, and the Zelensky government. And I saw these interviews go up and I knew that Ukraine is now, it's, it's banned all opposition parties. It's, Burned all media except for the, the, the main government channel. Uh, anybody who's seen as pro-Russian is, is arrested, tortured or killed. Um, and so I left. I realized, I mean, I've been deported from countries before. I was deported from Israel. I've been deported from Bahrain, gone through very scary experiences, locked in rooms and threatened with violence. So I know how these things can happen to journalists. And so I left and then went to this side. And now I'm on the, the Ukrainian so-called hit list, Mirat Vedets. Uh, I don't know if you know about that. So it's an online database of Ukrainian enemies of the state in which hundreds of children are on that list. So I did a story about a 13-year-old girl, Fina. Uh, you should get on the show. She's on the Ukrainian uh, enemies of Ukraine list. And she's a 13-year-old girl. Her, her home address is published on this site. And whenever they, a journalist is killed on this site, they write liquidated over, over the photo. So it promotes violence towards anybody on this site. And there's children on this site. When people talk about the Nazis or the far right of extremist elements of the Ukraine, you just have to look at this site, which puts the, the home addresses and photos and names of children and promotes violence against them. So I'm on that list uh, now. So I can't return. I can't go back to Ukraine. I'd be arrested or killed. Simple as that. And, and for journalists, I mean, I mean, Increasingly, journalists around the world, you know, journal, Julian Assange is in jail. So many journalists, increasingly, and now we're looking at this oncoming World War Three. I was at the front line uh, last week and I spoke to Russian soldiers. Who, they felt that they were fighting in the opening stages of World War Three. Mm. You know, a, a world war between uh, NATO led by the United States and China, Russia, Iran. And increasingly, journalists uh, do face potential of serious recriminations. Um, a friend of mine, German journalist, is facing three years imprisonment in Germany. She can't return home uh, in Germany because she's facing imprisonment. She's simply reporting the truth in Donbass. Her mother, I'm friends with her mother. She's a wonderful 60-year-old, 65-year-old woman. She's a spiritual healer. She's a wonderful, lovely woman. 
she had her bank account closed in Germany, and she's had to flee to, to, to flee to, to, flee to Russia as well. There's in, increasing persecution of journalists, um, and increasingly we're feeling very, very much under threat. Mm -hmm. Well, before we let you go, Johnny, where can people follow your work? Well, yeah, um, I'm reporting for, for Press TV here, also Twitter. Uh, I don't know if you put the Twitter handle up. I can't remember. Uh, on Telegram as well. Um, and yeah, I listened to some of your show, and it seems like you do fantastic work, guys. So thank you so much. Right on. No, thank you absolutely, and we'll we'll definitely get this out and tag you so people can follow you wherever you are and, and stay safe, and we're looking forward to talking to you again sometime. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, guys. <laughs>